want to thank you for uh, your willingness just to be out on a Sunday evening and to come and worship the Lord together. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 this evening. Uh, we've just been on our Sunday nights, we've been walking through the gospel of Matthew together. And, and our primary purpose with that has just been to see the fulfillment uh, of God's promises and prophecies in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and Matthew takes great care to show that Jesus uh, is the, the promised king, the promised Messiah. Uh, early on, we see, we, we, we see his ministry grow rapidly as people flock to see the miracles and the signs. Uh, and then as his influence spreads, so does the opposition, uh, particularly from the religious leaders. And so they reject Jesus Christ as king, as Messiah. We, saw, we see in John chapter 1 and verse 11, he came to his own, his own received him not. Uh, so last Sunday, uh, Troy shared several parables that kind of portrayed that rejection and in turn God's rejection of them. Uh, let me just remind you, if we just backtrack just a little bit. Go to chapter 21 and verse 43. Jesus speaking uh, to those religious leaders says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Uh, and so again, we see God's concern with the, the fruit-bearing uh, nature of his people and, and, and the rejection of those Jewish leaders who were uh, trusting in their own self-righteousness and rejecting their coming king and messiah. And so we've, we've been kind of moving quickly, almost a chapter at a time. We're going to slow things down a little bit tonight. Uh, the parable at the beginning of chapter 22 is, is almost a, a transition from uh, what we've seen there, them questioning the authority of Jesus, and then uh, moving in, we're going to see some, some back and forth between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the lawyers there. And, and so before we get into that back and forth between them, we want to just focus in on this parable uh, we know it as the parable of the wedding feast. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer, uh, and then we'll look to the Word of God. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and read our passage here, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pray. It's in verse 20, uh, chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call them who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized their, his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, it's been good to gather in your house together. Lord, we thank you for your word and how you've spoke to us already. Uh, Lord, we enter into your presence with thanksgiving. Lord, we come uh, before you with praise on our hearts for who you are and for what you've done. And Lord, as we come once again tonight, our desire is to hear from you. We thank you for your word. Lord, it's living and it's powerful and it's exactly what we need. And so I pray that you would speak to us once more as we come. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see wondrous things from your word. At the same time, we lift up those who are unable to be here tonight. Lord, we think of Lewis as they're on their way to Charleston. And Lord, you know what's going on with him and what's going on with his body. I pray you give the doctors and nurses wisdom there. But we pray for healing and strength. Uh, Lord, we pray for health for that family. Lord, the, the sickness they've faced and Lord, for many others who are unable to be here tonight for health reasons, Lord, uh, physically just unable to be out and would love to be here, Lord, we ask that you would just strengthen them up and give them grace, Lord. I pray they would feel your presence uh, today. And Lord, uh, we thank you for your faithfulness and your promises. You never leave us or forsake us. And 
Lord, we pray as your people gathered here tonight that our worship will be acceptable in your sight. Father, would you forgive us uh, for where we have sinned against you, uh, for our indifference, for our carelessness, Lord, for our lack of love for you, and Lord, for our love for things that, that are insignificant. Lord, we, we thank you for the blood of Christ tonight. Lord, we, we've come tonight to worship you, and so I pray that, that this would be a sweet time as we gather together. Lord, may you work in spite of me for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. So Jesus is going to tell a story, uh, a parable. It just means to lay alongside. So he takes something that the people would understand, a picture that they could grab a hold of to convey a spiritual truth. Right? And, and so he wants them to, to see uh, the nature of the kingdom of God. But in, in, in explaining the nature of the kingdom of God, he's going to use this parable of a wedding feast. And it's a little it's harder for us to grasp than it would have been for them. Uh, we don't have kings you know, within our culture, and, and our wedding feasts are quite a bit different than theirs would have been. Uh, this wedding feast that we read about that was thrown by the king for his son, uh, it, would have been, it would have lasted up to a week. Uh, and, and so preparations would begin long before that week-long festival. Uh, they would send out the invitations far in advance. And people would RSVP far in advance. And so you can just get this picture here as we read in chapter 22. And he compares this, right? So the king, I mean, the king offers out invitations to his son's wedding. Now, that's a big deal, isn't it? When you get an invitation from the king, that's pretty big. Right? And so you, can, you would think there would be some, some excitement, some anticipation. In fact, it seems like, the RSVPs all came back, right? They all said, yeah, you, king, you want us to come? We're in. That's an incredible honor to be invited to the wedding of the king's son. And, and, and so we have that picture there. But then notice, when, when everything is ready, and, and the feast is, is finally here, and the wedding celebration has come, we see there in, in verse 3, he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast but they would not come. Right? Now, this is meant to kind of strike you and, and kind of take you a little like, that wouldn't happen. Right? That's, that's the purpose. Right? So the invitation from the king, he sends out his servants to all the invited guests. He says, okay, the feast is ready. The party is here. Come on. And nobody comes. They got the invitation. They RSVP'd. And, and, and again, you know, you have to understand the nature of this, of this kind of, uh, when the king invites you to come, you don't refuse. You, you come, right? Or it could cost you your life, right? When the king says come, you come. But nobody comes. And, and what we see is just the grace of the king here. He's going to graciously just send his servants out once again. Uh, in verse 4, it says again, he sent other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Right, so he sends his servants back out again to his invited guests. Hey, the food's ready. The party's ready. Everything, and, and he's enticing them with just the, what's going to be there? What's available? The joy, uh, the celebration, the festivities, and the food and he's saying, it's all ready. Come. You don't want to miss this feast. You don't want to miss this celebration. And I think it's significant. You, you see that the father's desire, the king's desire to honor his son. Right? He wants guests there present. So this, this wedding feast is a celebration in honor of, of his son. And nobody comes. And he's, he sends them out again. Come, come. The feast is ready. And then in verse 5, we see the response once again. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business. How do they respond to the king's invitation? It's no big deal. Just indifferent, right? They just kind of ignore it and they go about their everyday business. Well, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, when you get an invitation from the king, you, you go. Right? Even if you don't like the king, right? I mean, you just, you go, right? And so everybody listening to this story is going, nobody would do that. 
The king has just laid out the table and said, come. And these guests are going, eh, I got things to do. Right? I, I, I got better. And they're, they're indifferent to the invitation. Well, some of them are indifferent, but not all of them are indifferent. Some of them are outright hostile. In verse 6, it says, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Well, that's where things get kind of crazy, right? Can you imagine? It, Jesus is telling this story, and everybody's going, what? What? They, they killed the king's servants? They don't just reject the invitation. They're not just indifferent to the king's call. They take the servants out, and they kill them. Nobody would do that. And that's the point. That's the point. The king's gracious offer to come and feast, and everyone rejects it, and they kill those who he sends out to invite. Well, of course, the king's response in verse 7 is is a natural response, right? The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. We see the seriousness of rejecting the king, right? The king's response is, 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 is appropriate justice for what has taken place. Now, again, this is a parable, right? It's a story that's meant to convey a a truth. And it's so incredible that those listening would have thought it was madness. And the irony is what? The irony is that Jesus is talking about them. That's the irony, right? It's It's not difficult to identify the characters. This is one of those parables you almost don't have to explain, right? The king is God, right? And and the son is is Jesus. And the feast is the marriage supper to be enjoyed in his eternal kingdom. And the invited guests are the Jews, especially the Jewish religious leaders. Right? They were the ones who were invited, what, ahead of time? Right? This is, you know, we, we see that you know, God's chosen, you know, called all, back through the Old Testament in Genesis and Exodus. We see this people get this, this unique invitation from God. And yet, they're indifferent eh, or hostile right? and, and so the servants who are who the servants are god's prophets god's proclaimers right john the baptist jesus himself the, those who god has sent to proclaim the message the gospel of the kingdom and it's going to continue on into the new testament we're going to see james and stephen who are martyred for the faith they're going to hear and they're going to reject and god's going to respond justly and rightly right? and you say well what what's this picture of burning the city and you know actually jerusalem is going to fall in ad 70 god's going to judge that city right? and they, about 30 years after jesus proclaims this this is a prophetic parable so the the people that god has invited reject that's what we see john 1 11 they came to his own his own receive him not they reject the invitation And that's a serious thing. So how does God respond to this rejection? Well, notice verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Now we need to stop there just for a minute and and make sure we understand what's being said. Why were they not worthy? They weren't worthy because they rejected the invitation. Right? It's not... It's not that their their worthiness has nothing to do with their status or their standing, their race or their religion. It has nothing to do with their morality in any way. They're not worthy, not because they weren't good or bad. They're simply not worthy because they rejected the king's invitation. And you see the graciousness of the king and patience and calling again and again. Come, the feast is ready. And they're either indifferent or they're hostile. And it's interesting, isn't it? That there's, no real, there's no, really no difference between those who are indifferent and those who are hostile. Both of them, both of them ultimately are left outside. Right? It's so it's, you can't just do nothing with, G, with Jesus, right? Yeah, they're, they're maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, unlikely on a Sunday night that you're indifferent. But maybe, right, you, you just say, you know what, I just... That, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't, I don't care about religion. I don't care about Jesus. I don't care about Christianity. You're not hostile, right? It's not like you, you're an angry atheist and you hate God. And you, you, just, you just don't care. But the thing is, whether you're angry, hostile, or whether you're indifferent, 
the end result is the same. You're still left outside, and that's a serious thing. It's a serious thing to reject the invitation of the king. So we see the response here. As God sends his servants out, the king sends out, he says in verse 9, Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. The king says what? (laughs) Open invitation. Right? Go out everywhere. Invite everyone. Right? It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. Come to my feast. Celebrate my son, good or bad, right? (laughs) Isn't that good, right? Again, we're seeing this picture here. The king is God. The son is Jesus. There's this invitation. What do we see? We see a gospel invitation, the gospel call to come, to celebrate, to know Jesus, to experience fellowship with his son. And it's open to anyone. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. both good or bad, right? you know, again, regardless of standing, it doesn't matter whether you're a great, you know, in fact, what we see here, it's, it's the, you know, when the king invites, his initial invitation would go to the elite, right? You know, the, those with high status. But in 1 Corinthians 1, we see what? Not many mighty, not many noble. God has chosen the foolish things to the world to confound the wise. And so we see a picture here of God bringing in those of, of you know, they're not significant. They're not important, but, oh, they're important to the king. Right? And so we have this picture here. And, and, and I want you to understand what's going on, right? Those who were invited long ago, they're not forgotten, right? But the invitation now goes to the ends of the earth. So initially, God was dealing primarily with the Jewish people, and then we have this beautiful beautiful picture of the universal gospel call so that we see here in verse 10, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. What's the result of this universal open invitation? (laughs) It's an epic feast. The wedding hall is overflowing with guests from all over. Revelation describes it this way. There are those from every tongue, tribe, and nation. God's going to save. God's going to rescue from all over. Right? There's going to be those all gathered around his throne, worshiping the Lamb. This is a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. Now, again, it doesn't mean that God has, you know, we see that picture there and we say, well, what about, what about the Jews? What about Israel? Well, God hasn't forgotten them, right? His plan is not finished with them. When you look at Romans chapter 11, you see that God still has a plan and a purpose for his people. But right now, we have this open, wide invitation. Anyone, everyone, anywhere can come to Jesus. Now, if God is sending his servants out, and giving this open invitation. And brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't that what we should be doing right now? We're in that period, right? We're in that time where right now we should be openly inviting people to come to partake in this feast. We're free now to say, come, come enjoy, come know, come experience the Son. Come worship the Son. We, you can have part in this wedding feast. And so God is sending out his servants to invite. Well, that's certainly what we should be doing right now. Now, we have this beautiful picture, but, notice verse 11, but when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. Now, that wouldn't have been hard to spot, right? <laughs> it, there, there's this vast Wedding hall filled with guests. And the picture here is this is a late invitation. Right? I mean, they just went out on the streets. They said, come. And so the natural, inc- you know, <laughs> the point is, is that the king would have been the one who's providing the wedding garment. They, didn't, they wouldn't have time to go home and change or get ready for a wedding feast. So the king says, you go bring them in, and I'll clothe them in proper attire. And what's that mean? What's that representative of? There you go, right? We can't miss it, 
Right? It, it, it's impossible for us to come into his presence in our own righteousness. We need the righteousness of Christ. Now, we have this picture here of one who comes, but he rejects the offer, right? He rejects the wedding garment. Now, I don't need that. Why, why would anybody say that? Because they're trusting in their own righteousness, right? <laughs> I don't need your garment. I'm just fine on my own, right? And so when the king comes in and he looks around, he says, you don't, you don't belong here. And it's, it's evident and it's clear immediately, and it's a good reminder. There are wheat among the tares. There are those who will say, Lord, Lord, who, to whom Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Jesus is speaking directly at these who believe, right? He said, I come for those who are sick, not those who are well. He's speaking right at those Pharisees and religious leaders who are looking at themselves and saying, I don't need anything. I'm a child of Abraham, and I'm good. And we see this picture here of this guest trusting in his own righteousness, not realizing that, not understanding that his righteousness is nothing but filthy rags before a holy God. And so God's response to this man in verse 12, he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Had nothing to say, right? Why? Because he had no excuse. No excuse. Now, this reminds me of, of Romans 3.19. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. When we stand before God, we have nothing, nothing to say, right? Apart from Jesus Christ in our sin, what can we say? We've rejected the invitation. We rejected the open call. It's, it's interesting here, he says to him, friend. <laughs> he says, Why does he call him friend? Well, this man assumes, you know, it, it's almost like Judas. Right? Isn't that the very first thing that Jesus says to Judas when he comes in the garden? Friend, what are you doing here? Right? And, and there's this picture here of, uh, of the king who knows, right? This man doesn't belong. He doesn't fit. And so, in verse 13, then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Get him out of here, right? He, he's rejected my gracious offer, so they bind him and they cast him out so he cannot return. And the picture is one in which he'll be filled with regret. You know, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is most assuredly a picture of of hell, right? Separated from the king, unable to enjoy fellowship with the son, rejection of the king's invitation, and, and his gracious offer of righteousness is a serious thing. And we see there in verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. It's a sad but true picture, is it not? The wide open invitation many are called right universal gospel call it goes out over all the earth but few are chosen wide is the way that leads to destruction right? narrow is the way that leads to life and few there are that find it you know we we can't we can't come to that word chosen and ignore it right we we can't miss the sovereignty of God over his kingdom. And, and yes, yeah, there's, there's no question that the, the will of man in receiving the invitation or rejecting the invitation is present. But there's this perfect balance to the sovereignty of God. That those who come, they come because he chose them. Right? Many are called, but few are chosen. Right? <laughs> John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's a mystery that's difficult for us to grab a hold of and understand, but we believe it because the Scripture teaches it so clearly. Many are called, few are chosen. You know, we want to, you know, we, we've, tried, we've tried to on Sunday night over the last uh, several months to just, give you a brief, uh, you know, just, just a short uh, 
devotion and then spend some time in prayer. And, and so we want to do that again tonight as a faith family, just pray together. And, and you know, we don't, we want to respond to the word that we've heard today. And so I, as we pray together, it's good for us to certainly give thanks. Wouldn't it be good if, if <laughs> when's the last time you just went to the Lord in prayer and just said, thank you? And didn't ask for anything. <laughs> just gave him praise for who he is and for what he's done. You know, maybe you want to do that tonight. Uh, I think it would be good for us just to stop and give thanks for the open invitation of the gospel uh, and, and for the righteousness that we have in Christ. Now, I would say this just as a word of caution, a word of warning. You know, I know it's Sunday night, but if you're here and you have You've never accepted that invitation. It's a serious thing to reject the call of God. When you feel, when you feel the Spirit moving and calling you to trust in Christ and you reject that, there's serious consequences that we see in the Word. I'd encourage you to, to make that decision tonight. Uh, and at, at the same time, it, it should be a reminder for us to pray fervently for the lost. Right, for those who are outside, and, and, and for, pray for boldness to go again. And, and we had some prayer requests that were mentioned earlier that we certainly want to lift up. We want to continue to pray for Lewis. We want to continue to pray. Becky. Praise the Lord. All right. So if you couldn't hear, they're heading home from the hospital. Lewis is doing all right. So that's good news and an answer to prayer there. So. Um, Becky's checking your phone during church, so we know what she's doing. <laughs> I don't need excuses. I, no, we're thankful for the prayer request. So. Um, let's, let's go ahead and, and look to the Lord together this evening. And here's, we, we, we've been kind of just asking people to pray directly, but I want to do something a little different this evening. I'm just going to have Troy open, and I'll close. And if you feel led to pray along with us tonight, then you can pray in between. Uh, I'll, I'll give you opportunity to pray and encourage you as we pray, you pray. You know, seek the Lord's face tonight. Ask him, thank him. Uh, you know, go to him with what's on your heart tonight. But Troy, you want to go ahead and open in prayer, and then I'll close after uh, we're sure everybody's had opportunity.